Sujit, you can make a start. Go for it. Shall I start? Can you hear yeah. me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so hello, everyone. So um, I'm going to present one case today. So let me see. Okay. So, so this is um, a 32 week, a nearly 32 week who's nearly three months old, corrected 46 weeks, uh, antenatally was found to have bilateral pleural effusions. Um, for which there was a pleura amniotic drain inserted on the right side uh, with good effect. The baby is ventilated dependent and is on prostin for this. So this baby's got a coarctation, antenatal coarctation, uh, and has been on prostin. And we were basically growing this baby for the baby to be ready to be um, uh, undergoing surgery and is on trophic feeds. Um, so this baby was on uh, respiratory support and had worsening respiratory support, uh, which then prompted this ultrasound uh, that you can see. So this is R1. Um, so there is sort of thickened pleura. You can see some pleural consolidations. There's a there's a, um, a B line. There is some consolidation seen here. Pleura is sliding there, but beyond that, uh, there is absence of pleural line. There is uh, a bit of pleural effusion. Um, that you can see, and there is um, uh, what looks like um, a tissue-like uh, sign here. There's some lung pulse that you can see. And moving on to R2, uh, so uh, there's good pleural sliding, there's thickened pleura uh, and lots of beeline subpleural consolidations. Uh, and moving on, so R3, again, thickened pleura, some subplural, subplural consolidations can be seen. I can see a hint of A-line, but predominantly a B profile, uh, as is the case in R4, uh, thickened pleura uh, and compact B-lines. Uh, moving on to R5, so you can see there is... So I can't see any clear um, pleural sliding. In fact, there's some lung pulse. You can, you can see the lungs sort of bobbing. There's clearly some pleural effusion that you can see, um, and which is more prominent uh, there. Um, so there is a deep pocket that you see. It's about two, two centimeters uh, of pleural effusion. The lung uh, that you can see there is just um, a bobbing in and out. I can see a little bit of uh, a sort of... Um, a band that you can see in the middle of the pleural effusion. Uh, on the left side, okay, so left side, uh, again, so thickened pleura, irregular, there is some subpleural consolidation seen pri primarily sort of B profile. And this is L2. So you can see thick pleura, irregular, some subpleural consolidations are seen. Uh, it's sort of, I'm seeing more of a lung pulse. Here you can see there is uh, suddenly a dropout in uh, pleural line. Yeah, there is no pleural line. There is a fusion there that you can see and you can see um, static air bronchograms. And given that this is an absent pleural line, possibly atelectasis. Um, and then moving on to L3. Uh, L3 again, uh, there is pleural sliding, though irregular pleura with B profile, predominantly B profile. I can just about see a hint of A line there. And on L4, similar picture, thickened irregular pleura with subpleural consolidations. Going more laterally, L5 and L6. Um, so this is L5. Uh, again, uh, Subpleural consolidation, I can just about see a hint of A-line, but predominantly B profile. And when you go to uh, L6, so you can see uh, pleura is moving. Uh, you can see, uh, this looks like a shred sign to me, uh, and it is irregular. You can see subpleural consolidations here. You can see just about in the corner there, a rim of peri uh, pleural effusion. And uh, when you put color uh, on that there is a blood flow so there is increased vascularity and this baby did have elevated uh, uh, c-reactive protein levels is on antibiotics and uh, this is what the x-ray looked like so that's probably the l2 region that you were seeing which is collapse consolidation with pleural 
effusion bilaterally. So uh, essentially, those thickened irregular pleura, pleural effusion seen bilaterally uh, with lung pulse. Uh, there was absent pleural sliding with some fib fibrin strands uh, on the right side, and there was static air bronchograms, possibly atelectasis with shred sign and subpleural consolidations. And given that this baby has been ventilated um, throughout his life, slightly ventilator associated pneumonia with atelectasis in this ventilated dependent infant with bilateral pleural effusions and coarctation of endocrine. Shall I go, that's all I had. Shall I go back to the first picture or is there? Uh, yes, please do. Yeah, yeah, let me go back to the first one. Uh, there is a question for you. Did the culture grow anything? No, so this baby's culture uh, did not grow anything. That said, um, the endotracheal tube secretions two weeks ago grew Entrobacter, uh, and the last two uh, 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 cultures were negative. This baby became unwell with line sepsis uh, and was sort of recovering from that, so was uh, on a period of antibiotics when this um, uh, scan was done. And how high were the CRP? So the CRP went up to 200, Nadia. So it was 200, the line was removed, there was clinical improvement seen. Um, and uh, subsequently, the last two uh, respiratory endotracheal tube secretions were negative. It didn't grow anything. It's a very interesting case. Thank you for sharing. So, which side was the was the pleural drain inserted antenatally? So, antenatally on the right side. On the right side, because it's it's interesting. The lungs are quite um, asymmetrical, aren't they? when it comes to the severity of the interstitial syndrome? Uh, yes, yes. So there was bilateral, there was bilateral disease antenatally, uh, mm -hmm. though the obstetricians inserted the right side of chest strain because there was more fluid on the right side and there was a good effect to it. But there is some underlying lung disease because at some point, you know, the duct was shunting bidirectionally. Mm -hmm. So, so the reason the baby didn't go directly to surgery was this baby was being worked up for interstitial lung disease and, um, you know, sort of had CT chest and things like that. So it's currently being... Yeah, what CT chest? Because this is very interesting. I mean, do we know why this baby needed uh, antenatal drainage? Why the cause of the bilateral heart? What, what the cause? No, so, so, so this was worked up at the thought screen. Everything's come back negative. It's not clear why the baby had the effusion. It's nothing to do with something more, I don't know, congenital, like an Unan syndrome or something. No, no. So the whole uh, genome sequencing has been done and it's all come back as negative. Well, going back to your scans, I think I have a little bit of problem. They're a bit dark on my, my screen, so I, maybe they might not be the same with yours. Uh, but it's an interesting image. Uh, is this something that later resolved and the one that's you said was R1, but you've labeled R2. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, this is mis this is mislabeled. Yeah. Uh, so it is it is actually R1. Mm. So and, the, yeah, please go ahead. Well, R1, there has always been a right upper lobe dense collapse um, that this baby's had, at least on the x-rays that you see. Mm -hmm. There's always this persistent uh, collapse that you're seeing on the right upper zone. And what did the CT scan show? Because this just could be... Well, just chronic lung disease, signs of chronic, chronic lung disease. Here. This is not any, there's no malformation or anything like this. No, no. They didn't find anything else on the CT chest. It's a bit unusual, though, to have the same image persisting at the same place over time, also on your lung ultrasound scans. Yeah. It doesn't really make sense, does it? Yeah, yeah. it's a bit odd. Yeah. <laughs> Very strange, because in chronic lung disease, you do have changes like this, but you know, you're positioning the baby, you're suctioning the baby, you're ventilating the baby, changing management strategies. So these mm -hmm. change, you know, when you flip the baby over, it opens up in one end and it closes in the other yeah, one. Yeah. Have the exact same place is really suspicious though. Mm -hmm. So this was not related to the possible uh, pneumonia. This was something this baby had before during. Yes, that that is right. Yeah, this is something. And when we spoke to the respiratory team, they they feel that sometimes you can get coexisting narrowing of the uh, 
uh, central airways. But uh, I mean, despite the CT, it didn't, there, there was no evidence of anything obvious. So they're working towards a lung biopsy. Yeah. Um, to see if there is an underlying tissue diagnosis that they can make. Yeah, it does look quite suspicious though. Mm -hmm. And then what I observed was mm -hmm. that in the right lung, uh, the, I mean, the number or let's say that the severity of the beeline uh, profile was much more than the left side. Because in the beginning, I was thinking this baby has multiple underlying um, causes of having bad lungs. Of course, it's a preterm baby, but there's the antenatal history. And then there's the fact that you have a monoprostin with uh, possibly a very big duct. Um, so in the beginning, I thought, yeah, that was maybe bilateral, you know, lung edema related to the really uh, bit large duct. Uh, but it's not the same on the other side. So, I mean. No, I agree with you, Nadia, because even on the imaging, the chest X-rays, there's always the right side. You f you find that the changes are much worse than on the left side. Mm. So uh, yeah, I, I don't know if that, that is that doesn't that doesn't go with at least. Uh, I mean, there must be some degree of cardiovascular hemodynamic uh, edema, but it doesn't explain this. Yeah. Um, could we move on to the next yeah. slide, please? Uh, let me go to R two. So I'm not sure if this is just the frame rate on our Zoom, but from what I see here, I mean, here we can see there's lung sliding, but R4 is becoming more fuzzy. So I don't know if it's a question of the frame rates uh, or it's a question of settings on your machine, because you did say at some point it was difficult to see sliding, although there was movement. So mm. I was. I was wondering whether it also had something to do with settings, but of course, the pleural lung is extremely irregular all over with small consolidations. And yeah. I'm sure how that turned out once you treated the lung and and uh, and manage, I mean, increase the ventilation. So, 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 uh, so the baby is actually better having been sat in about forty to sixty percent oxygen when I did the scan uh, over the weekend. Uh, now the the settings have come down, so they're in about thirty percent oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, on a mean airway pressure of about sort of eight, eight to nine. So there is some respiratory improvement uh, clinically, but I, I have to say the, the lung pictures um, haven't changed very much. So there's still this. That's light. interesting because they often precede the clinical improvement, or at least they go hand in hand with the clinical improvements. I mean, an adult, I mean, in uh, this is one of the uses of the lung scoring in adult medicine. It's um, to see how, um, I mean, how patients improve or don't improve um, uh, on antibiotics when they when they acquire ventilated associated pneumonia. But this is this picture is so rich. There's so much more than what you expect for just pneumonia. So I think it would be interesting to see the rest. And could we move on to the left lung, especially yeah, yeah. the yeah, art? Uh, I had a bit of a problem understanding what we were seeing. Um, was it this one? Yeah, I think L2 probably. Of course, you've got the heart taking up a big place in, in L1, but the L2, I think. Uh, L2. 20 or what? Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm unsure about exactly where we are and what the thing on the left is. You think it's the lung or it's... I, I think that is the That's lung. Where we are. Where? No, I think that is the lung, uh, uh, Nadia this mm -hmm. uh, and um, i did put color to this and it didn't glow up i didn't put a slide so at right at the bottom because there was a little bit of a um, vessel that i could see but this what you're seeing this brightness here there was no color going through not mirroring of the stomach for example no 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 so my probe was you know so it was uh, just besides the heart and it was sort of tilted so it was away from yeah so you have that's really good having picked that up we don't usually manage to do that. And this is where it, this corresponds to the area where you have the opacity on the chest X-ray then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's very interesting. And uh, yeah, so I don't know if there's a bit of it. So this baby has a bit of an effusion on the left side. It's always been uh, the right side that's worse than the left. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> and then moving on. Uh, yeah, so this was L3 and 
but I agree with you. The the B lines look more compact on the right side than on the left. No, side. it's a different pattern. It's not the same. This is not a four B profile mm. because you've got a mixed pattern. You've got the the thick and B lines going down. Probably something to do with the septa and so forth. But on the right side, it's a complete B profile, except for maybe a few exceptions. It looks different. So this doesn't really correspond with you know hemodynamic edema only because you would expect them to be the same, but it allows you to see the difference. So yeah, yeah. very interesting case. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, yeah no, thank you so much. Yeah. I will stop. Oh, sorry, did, did you put um, Doppler on this bigger, you know, the, 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 the tissue like sign on the right side that has persisted? No, 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 I, I have, no, I didn't put the Doppler there, uh, Nadia, probably in my next scan, I should probably put it in. It would see. be very interesting to see. Yeah. Maybe it would be something surprising that could possibly, you know, mm -hmm. give some information towards the, you know. That's a good thought. It's a good thought. I, I, I didn't think of it or that, but I, next time when I scan, I'll do it. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Sujit, did you, yeah. are you guys planning a CT by any chance? No, so, so CT was done, a look. Yeah. So the baby went across uh, for a respiratory assessment because uh, by three weeks, there was bidirectional flow across the ductus and the cardiologist felt that the coarctation should not yep. give you evidence of pulmonary hypertension. So prior to the cardiac surgery, the, they wanted to make sure that this isn't, this isn't a, a severe lung disease, which you know is not uh, uh, amenable to putting the, surgery, uh, the child through surgery. So I had a CT chest the conclusion of which was uh, uh, a C, uh, just a chronic lung disease, and then had the R14 exome sequencing, um, which didn't pick up anything. But would you pick up a noonan on that, just with the or do you have to do some specific research? No, the geneticist feels that the noonan will be covered with that. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Um, so interesting case, I'll, I'll keep you posted. What, what yeah, you very know. interesting. Yeah. I think there's a diagnosis to be made on this, you know, the yeah. math on, on the right, whatever we're seeing on the right. But I think Doppler could be could be really interesting. Yeah, and I'll, next time I scan, I'll, I'll do the Doppler. Uh, you have a couple of more questions on this. Uh, what was the analysis of the plural, fu uh, plural fusion? So the plural fluid antenatally showed predominantly lymphocytes. In so keeping with the chylothorax. Yeah, in keeping with the chylothorax. Now, that said, this baby's been on trophic feeds because of the risk of NEC and is getting mum's milk and we haven't seen an increase. I know it's a small amount, but we haven't seen an increase mm. in, uh, in, in the trophic, in the, uh, sorry, in the plural effusion. And the, the, you know, the respiratory people also didn't want to do any further. Uh, they didn't want to uh, have uh, any yeah. gap. No, they didn't want to do post no. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Shall I stop sharing? I can't, yeah. I think that's, yep, that's. Fine, fine, I'll stop yeah, Atnafu, are you happy to go next? Yes, uh, look, I can present. I'm really grateful. Thank you. No, thank you. Atnafu, would you just like to give an introduction to Nadia? Just. Uh... Okay. So, thank you, Dr. Alok, and uh, also. My classmate, I can say, is I'm a pediatric cardiologist working here in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Uh, though I'm a pediatric cardiologist, I'm frequently being invited by the neonatologist to do echocardiography in the NICU. So I usually see babies with respiratory problem rather than cardiac problem. And just, that's the reason why I'm interested to attend this training. And Dr. Alok was willing to give me the chance to attend and really I'm thankful of him. I hope I will help the neonatologist in every aspect regarding lung ultrasound. And if I'm, I feel that I'm competent in the future doing in ultrasound, I will just hope to train them so that they can do by themselves. I will focus on my, my heart. Thank you. Thank you. It goes well with today's topic of heart and lung. So, can you see my slide? Yeah, you will need to go to full screen, Dr. Atnafu. Thank you. Is it not full screen? Uh, no, it's still slide mode. 
you mean just I made it slide mode? Is it not slide mode? Uh, it's uh, you might have to close it and open it just once more. Okay. Stop sharing and uh, stop sharing. sharing and share again. Yeah, and then just okay. go to full screen. Yeah. Right. How about now? Uh, no, I can't. Uh, can anybody else see anything? No, not yet. No. Just I stopped sharing. Yep. Then I shared my screen. Yep. So, so. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Just I have to click again. How about now? We can't see your slides. Can you see it? Uh, no, we can't see your slides. We can see a, oh. a, a blank screen. You might, uh, is, have you opened your PowerPoint? Yeah, I have opened it. Let me minimize it and share it again. Sure. Take your time. This is not important. <clears throat> The other option is maybe while you're sorting it out, uh, Dr. Didi, are you able to share? Hi, look, I'm struggling right now. So uh, give no me a minute, please. Sure, no problems. Uh, Can I exit and just join again? Or yeah, 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 that's absolutely fine. No problems. Let me, let me exit from Zoom meeting and I will join it again. So Sharif, you you also have some slides to present. Do you want me to present now? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Just while I've, our other colleagues are finding their feet. Right. Okay. Uh, let me share the screen. Can you share my, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yeah. Right. So, great. So, uh, hi everyone. Hi Alok and uh, hi Nadia. Uh, thank you for your uh, inputs and your efforts um, with us. So today I, my name is Sharif and I'm one of the neonatal consultants at uh, St. Peter's Hospital in the UK. Um, today I present uh, uh, a lung ultrasound uh, of a baby. This baby is triplet number three. Um, uh, actually, the triplets were 24, born at 24 plus one weeks. Uh, triplet two and three are uh, in the hospital, triplet uh, one uh, in another hospital. Um, so this is triplet three, was born at 24 plus one, birth weight was 570 grams. Uh, mom had an emergency caesarean section because of uh, an, um, severe antenatal hemorrhage, uh, just received one dose of surfactant, uh, sorry, one dose of steroids and a loading dose of magnesium sulfate. Uh, also among the history, mom had GBS positive in this pregnancy. Uh, the baby was born uh, in poor condition, required intubation uh, immediately after birth. And then there was, during the transfer from uh, uh, this hospital to our hospital, for escalation of respiratory care, the baby had um, accidental extubation and required CPR and adrenaline um, on, on just before the transfer. Uh, 
this is day 10 of life. Uh, and when uh, the time I did the ultrasound lung, and the baby remained ventilation since birth on um, uh, uh, PCAC volume guarantee. The required maps, uh, the required pressures were about 18 and maps were about 10. The oxygen um, was all the time below 30% uh, of the time. Um, this baby, unfortunately, by day eight of life, had twice accidental extubations. The baby was quite active. Um, and then uh, didn't tolerate um, vaposarum and CPAP and then was reintubated again. So that was the X-ray after the uh, reintubation at day eight. Um, you could see hyper expansion uh, on, um, um, on both sides and some PIE changes. Um, I believe one of my colleagues just pulled the ET tube slightly back after this X-ray. Uh, by day 10, uh, I did uh, an ultrasound lung uh, for the baby because the oxygen requirement just increased to uh, 35%. So that was R1. Sorry, I forgot to label it, but I um, that was R1. Uh, so I can see some uh, pleural is sliding. It's uh, irregular. So basically, I use a probe of the linear probe frequency of eight um, and here i could see on the uh, r1 uh, there is a, a pleural sliding irregular uh, and continuous pleura um, here i could see some pleural consolidation um, on on the left side and there is common details as well and in the middle of the screen here there is a compact B line. I could appreciate some A lines here um, on the cranial part. Um, and then I put, um, actually I complete my presentation, but I would like to mention uh, something. I put the M mode, I'm still at R1, which I can see uh, clearly here. There is, a, I can see the heart coming on the way but I could appreciate also some pleural sliding. Um, in the M mode here, I could see a mix of um, barcode and um, sandy beach sign, which I, I don't have explanation why the barcode sign is coming there, uh, but I, I could see pleural sliding and I, I tried to repeat it in, I could put the probe, um, or the, I mean the cursor here in, in many areas, but it just gives me the same picture of mixture between barcode and um, seashore sign. Sharif, can I, can I comment on that? Yes, please. Uh, keep keep the, the, <laughs> the, the clip going, please. Yeah. Uh, what do you call the barcode here? Can you see my... Uh, I can see it, yeah. If you look above that, do you still see the C? I mean, you, you have, uh, you can't see my pointer, of course, but if you would be as kind as to keep moving your, no, go back again, keep Sorry. moving the, 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 the hand, your pointer, even further up, 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 yeah. This is the area that is not sliding. If all your screen had been black and with these parallel lines, that would have been a barcode slash stratosphere sign. But you have a difference between the upper part of the screen, which is not sliding with the subcutaneous tissue and the ribs. Oh, okay. Whatever, yeah. yeah. Got the heart, which is why it's giving you a little bit of pulse and a little bit of sliding, but you've got movement. If there had not been long sliding in this area, you would have had black all the way down. Or not black, but you know, these, these parallel lines you have for you have a very small area where you have no sliding, right? Because of the way you've set the depth. But this area where you have the pointer now, if it had gone all the way down to the screen, then that would have been absence of sliding. Okay, so do you mean because of this area, which is black, this this black area? Uh, I, I'm calling it a black area, but that's that's that. Let's if we go to the right side of your screen, still above there, there you can see the horizontal lines 
uh, on the other side, I'm sorry. I don't know oh. what the right and left one is being projected. On yeah. The, yeah, here. If you'd have that image all the way down, that's yes. been a stratosphere sign. But here you don't. You have a clear difference between the upper part. And if yeah. you had possibly had a larger area that was subcutaneous tissue and so on, this um, narrow area would have been larger. And But in any case, you have movement there. There is absolutely no sign of, of no lung sliding or not yes. no movement. And of course, it looks a bit different because I think you have the lung pulse with it. So it's kind yes. of, and the sliding is kind of mixed up. It's right beside the heart. Uh, if you do not have any movement of any kind, lung pulse, lung sliding, then uh, in the time where you don't have these movements, you would see the same thing where you see between zero and 0 0.5 centimeters all the way down. Okay, I okay. see. Okay. Yes, yes, got that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, then that was uh, R2. So in R2, I uh, can see um, uh, the pleurostive sliding. It's uh, irregular um, and uh, thick. Uh, it's still sliding. And I here I can see um, uh, if you can see my pointer, I wasn't sure about this part, whether it's a line, but I found it. It's like it's a bit odd to be just one single a line in the middle. I I thought about deep consolidation, uh, maybe, uh, but uh, I wasn't sure to be honest. What is that? Um, other than that, I could see. Uh, I can't appreciate any b lines or a lines. Um, in in that so uh, i would appreciate also if you can describe this um with me like helping me in describing shall i say it um white outline but i'm not i'm not entirely sure it's the white outline what i really like is that you've identified so we know it's the lung and there is movement sliding i do agree with you that the lung surface uh, the pleural line is thickened and irregular uh it's an eight megahertz probe. So of course we're seeing the images and they're blown up. Um, I, I guess it's the liver uh, here on the right side of the screen. Yes, right? yes, yes, correct. And the thing is, I don't really know what we're seeing here and you'd have to move the probe around for this area where you were asking, is it an A-line or is it not? It might or it might not be. Uh, and only you would know when you're actually rescanning, maybe moving your probe over to vertical horizontal to get a global overview. But uh, if we go back to the image. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I just it stopped screening. Uh, I, I will share it again, sorry. You asked the question whether this was a deep consolidation or not. Yes. And I just to be sure, we mean the same thing by deep consolidation. What do you mean by deep consolidation? I mean, it's, um, I try to play with uh, the frequency, try to low down the frequency down to six to see, but this remains the same. Yeah, it would remain the same, you know, but I'm not really sure what you mean by deep consolidation. Do you mean a consolidation that goes really deep or do you mean a consolidation that is inside the lung that doesn't touch the pleural surface? No, I mean by that a deep consolidation, uh, a part of uh, that I can't visualize with um, um, like the higher frequencies. Uh... So I think well, what, what can... Nadia is asking, uh, Dr. Sharif, is that normally a consolidation that's visible in ultrasound should have some continuity with the plural line. Yeah. You, so that's what she's trying to get to. Uh, I, I, that's that's exactly it. Maybe you have, I mean, if if you had a consolidation that you wanted to see and you wanted to switch the frequency to go deeper into. Uh, or have a better penetration, you would still always have some changes at the level of the pleural line. Yeah. 
if you don't have any contact with the pro line, even though it's a massive consolidation that goes all the way down, you will not be able to see it, right? Because it's surrounded by air. So the fact that you do not have any, at least in the clip you're showing us, and maybe if you move the probe, you will see it somewhere else. That's possible. But in this clip, hmm. the pro line is irregular, but there is no shred sign. There is no discontinuity. It's continuous. Uh, yes. If if you had had a break in your pro line, then that would have been uh, a probable uh, diagnosis. But here we don't have it, so we don't really know either. Either it's an A line, yeah, or not. Uh, and I'm sure oh. when you scan the patient, you were able to look. So when you do that, you'll be able to assess for that. Maybe there is a part that we're not seeing in this clip where there is. Yeah you know, sign of consolidation at the plural level. But if this is the only place you see this and nowhere else you have any uh, changes in the plural line, it, it's not a consolidation by definition. Okay. All consolidations have to be in contact with the plural line. If they're micro consolidations, what many of us call subplural or larger consolidations, there has to be, it has to start the plural line because if you don't have that, you cannot see it. It might be there. Okay. In adult, so you, you mean that deep that consolidation that. should be associated in mostly with uh, break, uh, like discontinuation it of the pleura? It must be for us to see it. Yeah. Uh, so if we're seeing something and there is no break, it's not a consolidation. It's just, yeah. you know, we're using the limitations of the technique. In adults, maybe or less than 10%, maybe 10% of, for example, pneumonias uh, are uh, not in contact with the pleural line. In children, this has not really been shown, but who knows? Maybe there's a tiny percentage, and in the newborn, even less so. So the probability is 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 that, that we miss something is there. Yeah. It's much less than an adult, but if you did have something, you would have to be able to see it and understand it would have to be in contact with the prone line. If it's small or much deeper that you have to you want to go further down. Uh, and changing the frequency here would not really help you that much. Uh, and also to get another different imaging, somebody asked whether we would see better with, with the higher frequency. Of course, the higher frequency, the better image you get, but is it really necessary for the lung? Not necessarily, it depends on what you're used to seeing. I'm used to seeing images with a high frequency and in the small newborn, you're more comfortable above 10 to 12 megahertz, but this does the job, right? So yeah. Yeah, that's great. Sorry, Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, also, may I ask you because on the X-ray on the right side, I could see clearly on the X-ray PIE changes in this baby. Mm. Does this clip can help me uh, diagnose, uh, like helping me in the diagnosis of PIE changes? In your opinion, what would you expect to see in PIE? On like maybe small. More, um, actually, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Would anybody have anything to suggest? From the uh, images that we've uh, looked at uh, on babies uh, with um, uh, chronic lung disease, uh, uh, it's more of a um, really uh, less aerated lung. Uh, probably uh, predominantly B profile with, um, with some uh, fluid mainly predominantly uh, causing this. Uh, this is my my feeling about the um, current lung disease. Or is that was that the question? Current lung disease or a PIE? My so question was mainly about PIE. So PIE oh, is edema, right? Yeah. 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 So uh, I don't have much experience on that because I don't see it much. But uh, what would you expect to see in emphysema? Uh, be a bit of wet lung, small areas of um, like cystic areas with on what? the X-ray. But uh, with what? What are you seeing on the X-ray? Like here on the X-ray, I could see some cystic areas. That are air filled, right? Air filled, We're looking yes. For air. So, what yes. would you expect to see on the ultrasound scan? Going back to the image where you asked, could this be compatible with 
with with with PIE. Yeah. Well, wrong programs. Well, I don't know. I think you would have. I totally agree that this occurs in bad lungs, right? Lungs mm -hmm. with chronic disease changes, where you would have uh, areas that are non aerated. Definitely yeah. you would have areas with B lines for sure. You would have a thickened, irregular plural um, uh, line, yes. But in the area with emphysema, you would have areas where you would pick up air, right? Yes. So, and we are not doing this here. This is predominantly white. If you mm. have areas, it's, you always have to start at the plural line. Stuff that's in the middle doesn't make any sense. It has to start at the plural line. Uh, we're not really sure what that is. This maybe mirroring from the abdomen. Is it maybe an A line? I don't know what it is. It's okay. maybe it's an A line, but yeah. I know it's not an area of pleural emphysema of of emphysema that I can pick up. If it is, it is hidden somewhere. So, but I mean, you, the change you always have to start at the pleural line. If you it's there's nothing on the pleural line, then it doesn't make sense because we're not really seeing the lung. The second thing is, if it were PIE, in addition to the interstitial changes, you would have areas where it could almost look like pneumothorax because you have smaller areas, mm. but they would be more localized depending on how big and large it is. Um, so you would have, or maybe areas with less lung sliding, but more distended areas. And this is not the case. This is, except for this round thing here in the middle that we don't really know what it is. Right. Maybe somewhere else there is, but you would expect to see more air. They have to be air on somewhere because yeah. of the edema, right? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, so this is L, uh, sorry, R3. In R3, I can um, see that um, uh, pleura is sliding and uh, it's more of a uh, I, I could see some compact B lines. Um, again, I, I would say it's, uh, I can't see any A lines in this uh, clip. Um, it's more of B profile. I, uh, there is some micro pleural, uh, uh, sub pleural micro consolidation here on the left side of the um, screen as well. I think they're everywhere. Yes. Does that make sense to you with the clinical picture? Uh, yes, because I, I believe the baby had was extubated two days back. And I think when the baby was re-intubated again, uh, I believe the team left some time, baby is only 550 grams. Um, they try to keep the baby a couple of hours on high flu and then CPAP. I believe that maybe um, like post extubation complications as some areas of collapse happened. Um, and also the X-ray showed some RDS as well. So lack of aeration could be seen and appreciated in most of the uh, videos. Yeah, what was it? Yeah, this is a 24 weeker though. And yeah. that has really not hasn't been extubated. So that was something we would expect to see. So yeah. Yeah. And would you describe that as I, I um, like it's more B profile, right? When if if I want to score using Brad score, I could use what like would, score of two. I would use a score of two, definitely. Oh, okay. This is uh, Lichtenstein's B profile, uh, which he uses for hemodynamic edema, but yeah. we use for RDS, and it is a score of a two. Uh, then I went to the left side. Uh, this is L1. Uh, in L1 here um, on the, uh, I could see the pleura is sliding. Uh, and on there is micro consolidation all the way through, through the pleura. Um, could, could you point at those, please? Yeah, here, here, you could see some micropleural consolidation as well. Okay. I could see uh, B lines. Um, 
also A lines, but it's uh, it's mainly of B lines of B profile, which is more predominant uh, in here. Um, I wasn't sure maybe because of the position of the probe that uh, I can see that um, the I can see that the pleura is continuous. Uh, but in this part, I wasn't sure if it's it's not too large to say it's it's a big consolidation, but it's still I can prescribe it as micro consolidation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is L two. Um, I could appreciate that the pleura is sliding. Um, and there is still micropleural consolidation. I could see some A lines, but it's mainly of B profile um, on the upper part of uh, the video. Here on, so there is a double lung point here because I can't see um, A lines on this part. Um, I could see A line here on the right side of the uh, video. Uh, but again, it's mainly B profile. I wouldn't use the term double lung point. Okay. Uh, because you have, um, you don't really have two different patterns. Mm. Double lung point is when you really have two different patterns with sliding and you have different degrees of severity of the same pattern here. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that. Okay. Uh, going to L3, um, pleura is sliding, micropleural consolidation, subpleural microconsolidations. Um, I, I can see less aeration here. I would probably go for, oh, so long as it looks like white out lungs here. Um, I believe here, I uh, when I saw that clip after that, maybe I can change um, or go down with the frequency in order to see deeper structure because the uh, middle half of the clip, it's all totally black. Um, um, Sharif, I, I don't want to do that, but you can go as deep as you want. We're yeah. not being the long here. So <laughs> you can just, you know, I think you need to adjust the way you're holding the probe to be a bit more parallel. Okay. And, and you could change your depth if you want to, but we're saying exactly the same thing. We can't see the lung. I mean, I know I say I see the lung. I'm convinced I see that, but we cannot see the lung. These are just artifacts. So changing the oh. frequency will not help you. This is not real. This is in our heads. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Consolidation, yes, but uh, the artifacts, no. They, you won't get any additional information. Okay. Uh... I, I just tried in this uh, video just to visualize a, a ET tube because that was, uh, I was told it was just pulled out. I could get the, like I couldn't use a, a linear probe because it was too big for the baby. So I used a cardiac probe just to see, uh, trying to get the aortic arch and trying to see um, uh, the ET tube which I believe it should be ideally one centimeter from the arch of the aorta. I could appreciate it on the top here. I tried to repeat it again and I, I could see it here. So uh, I, I, I um, their entry was equal clinically on both sides. So I presume this is in a good position. And you also had equal lung sliding on both sides, which could also help you. Yes. Know that, yeah. E equal lung sliding, yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a few questions for you here, um, yeah. or maybe for me, I don't know. Can you have a non-microconsolidation with intact pleura? You can have many consolidations with intact pleura, you just won't see them. Um, we don't really know what's happening in the lungs if there is no uh, contact with the pleura, but many things can exist exactly like when you have pneumothorax, the lung underneath can be completely diseased or consolidated, even if there's air. And I don't know how you can have both, but theoretically speaking, um, because you can't see it. 
so yes, you can have uh, non micro consolidation within Techpura, just you will not be able to see it. And again, this is something probably very rare uh, in children and in the newborn as compared to adults, but we don't really know. Uh, and then the dynamic, if we could see your last scan on the left, Suman is wondering whether it's the dynamic bronchogram. Um, is, is, this the, is this the scan you wanted to ask about, Suman? This one? I don't know. No, I mean, uh, that was the last one on the left. Yeah. Shall uh, I go? Yeah, I think that must be the one. Uh, if the question is for me, I can't see any bronchograms at all, but. Um... Oh, okay. I got you. That was the last one on the left. Yeah. Do we see any bronchograms? Yeah, there are some tiny bronchograms indeed. But I think, yeah, maybe on the left side, maybe further to the my left of the screen. Um, impossible to say. They're tiny, tiny. These are micro consolidations with a scan that is not completely or, um, vertical uh, or at least perpendicular, which means that we're seeing a more rounded effect of the pleura instead of a line. And then we will see more of these tiny little micro consolidations. So I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's a, I think it's a constructed image because of the way the, the scan is being done. I think once you scan more perpendicularly, you will see them a bit differently. But maybe there are some and I can't see it. I see there's one over here that keeps jumping in and out on the second intercostal space from the left. But um, it's difficult to say. Right. I think it's the scan. Okay. So Nadia, I I know that some of the scans are not very accurate, maybe because of my the position of the probe. But if you are uh, going to report this scan, what mainly you you will, what are you going to write in the report? What would you write? <laughs> okay. So. I write in the pleura that the pleura is sliding and uh, uh, thick mainly, uh, like I, I could appreciate it, most of the slides were thick, but probably I can um, uh, put talk about the right side and then I'll talk about the left side or the other way around. So on the right side, the pleura is thick, um, sliding, irregular, and with uh, uh, micro consolidations, subpolar micro consolidations, uh, and there is no um, evidence of effusion and no evidence of pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. And mainly the lung, I call it as white out lung um, on the right side. On the left side, maybe I could appreciate some A lines, uh, but it's mainly B profile. Um, but on the lateral sides of the lungs, there is um, a white out lungs as well. So I would say picture consistent with uh, RDS. Well, he's 10 days old. So I think uh, without making a, a diagnosis on RDS or not, because he's 10 days old, I think I totally agree with you the way we have reported. It's really clear and it sums up perfectly what we're seeing. Um, however, what we can say is that it is predominantly non aerated lung and an infant who has had RDS and is probably progressing to BPD or not. But in any case, it's a severe interstitial syndrome. Yeah. Um, and then we can call it RDS, post RDS, beginning, uh, I mean, progression towards BPD, whatever you want to call like evolving it. Evolving chronic lung disease. Or... Yeah. Well, I mean, this lung hasn't cleared up after surfactants. We still are in, in, we're seeing almost the same, I would guess that we saw in the beginning. So this is the lung that is, has not been aerated. And you wouldn't think that's just because this baby was extubated because it, it's not the picture we're seeing. We're seeing exactly what it looks like in RDS. So I agree with you. It's just that at 10 days, you wouldn't give that diagnosis. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah.
Thank you. I think Dr. Atnafu wanted to present. Okay. Okay, let, thank you. Let me share my screen. Hope this time it will work. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the inconveniences. I will present one case. <clears throat> uh, a baby born at gestational age of 14 weeks. Birth weight was 3.8 kilogram. Mode of delivery was spontaneous vaginal delivery with vacuum assisted or fetal distress on second stage of labor. Baby developed respiratory distress and subgillial hemorrhage right after delivery and taken to the NICU. Uh, and baby was transfused with Pacta uh, RBC for if viranemia hemoglobin was eight just at admission, baby has large subgillial hemorrhage with bulky head. And after transfusion, baby continued to have the respiratory distress and lung ultrasound was done on day eight of postnatal age. Actually, the neonatologist asked me to do echocardiography at this age. And echocardiography showed structurally normal heart, but uh, with uh, PPHN, uh, PA pressure was high, 65 millimeter mercury, and right chambers were dilated, RA, RV was dilated. And at the same time, I did lung ultrasound using GE machine with phased array probe, 6X uh, frequency and uh, abdomen reset. This was the X-ray of the baby taken at the fourth postnatal age. I think you can see there is opacity over the right lungs, particularly in the lower margin. And I'm not sure if the cost of renic angles are obliterated on both sides, particularly on the right side. And also the cardiac margin is not clear. See, cardiac silhouette is not clear on the left side, left mid zone. So this was a lung ultrasound that showed some Coastal view, uh, right pleural fusion, and also this one L6 showing. I just I said this is uh, hepatized lung at the apex. Sorry, I don't know why it is not moving, but this is the apex of the right lung at the base. It's hepatized. Could you just describe, please, it's, you've got a hepatization and then this rounded area on the other one, the one that's not moving. This one is so yeah, plural sorry, fusion, one. right side, this one. Yeah, this one, the round thing, is that a consolidation or is that effusion? The, the it, one there is a fusion, there is a fusion. The rounded yeah. thing in the middle, uh, not in the middle. This one, it, yeah. it, what is this? It's, this is hepatized lung actually. Okay. I, I, yeah. I don't know why it is not moving, but yeah, yeah I can it's see it like yeah, you can see this. Yeah. Mm. And uh, this is L4 showing thickening and uh, but sliding plura with compact B lines here. And this is. Uh, R4 and R5, I think you can see hepatized lung, mm -hmm. solidified. And here also hepatized lung with lung pulsation as well as pleural effusion here. I can see the pleura actually. And R6, just actually I have to tilt the probe, you can see this is pleural effusion with some, some sort of uh, uh, fibrin deposition, you can see. And this is hepatized lung with color flow showing flow into it. So this is consolidated lung. 
and finally, we try to see the jellyfish sign. This is completely hepatitis lung. This is a liver. This is pleural effusion, solid white lung, and actually B lines. I don't know. There is no pleural around here, but I can see B lines coming out of it. This is completely the lung, actually, solid white lung. So in conclusion, the left lung is consolidated with compact B lines, right pleural effusion and the consolidation, which are consistent with findings of pneumonia. Maybe was transfused for severe anemia and meconium aspiration was also considered, managed for that. And after doing this lung ultrasound, the neonatologist just trained the right pleural effusion and the respiratory condition improved. The oxygen requirement also decreased. Till the baby is in, in the NICU, I hope I will do another lung ultrasound. I will show you hopefully the changes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting case. Um, I was wondering, what did the, um, the plural tap show? Uh, I, I, I didn't get exact profiles, but uh, there are, the, the, the neonatologist told me that he also considered pneumonia based on the clinical X-ray and the plural uh, analysis. Sorry, I didn't get, I didn't ask this exact cell analysis findings. Uh, and also somebody, uh, I'm also asking, if there were any inflammatory markers that... Uh... CRP was negative, it was not raised, but actually it was done just before this, yeah. this ultrasound was done. Which and is blood culture normal. didn't grow anything. Baby was on, on antibiotics actually right after birth and there was no growth in the blood culture. So this was not blood in any case. Um, Which one? Uh, I mean, the fusion we're seeing. And I, no, it was not blood. Was not, yeah. So since it, there was, and this was not something that you think could have been, uh, I, I forgot which day this was, I'm sorry. But in relation to uh, meconium. Age aspirin, day. Age day. The first day? Meconium age aspirin, day, no, the age day. Eight day, yeah, no, there wouldn't yeah. have been any changes with meconium aspiration mm. eight days, no. Interesting that the CRP levels were not high, though. Um, may I have a question, please? Yeah, yeah, sir. Go ahead. Can we go back to L6? This one or this one? Yeah, may I ask, is this hyper ecogenicity it's like, uh, in favor of consolidation in the right image? Yeah, or Dr. Yeah. Nadia? Oh, it's for me, sorry. Okay, uh, sorry, could you could you get the clip to move? Which hyper ecogenicity, uh, you mean? Uh, yeah, hopefully this one. Just below, just below, just yeah. below, in the middle yeah. of the image. Yeah, uh, I see. Uh, where Dr. Atnafu has put the point, had put the pointer. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is part of a of a consolidation where you have, they might be like sub B lines that start off at the consolidation and not at the plural line. Um, uh, Sharif is asking whether it's a shred sign. What do you think, Dr. Atnafu? Uh, I'm thinking hepatized lung rather yeah. than shred sign or other things, because this is a spleen. I'm sure this is a spleen because I'm right on the left side posteriorly. This is a spleen and this is normally the plural junction, but this so, is hepatized yeah. lung, solidified lung. Maybe if we had seen the clip, it would also be easier for us um, to see. But in any case, the question is, is this, uh, are, are these, uh, the hyperechoic, uh, the hyperechoic one is um, is more the equivalent of, of bronchograms or, or or the opening up, let's say, of a consolidated lung tissue. And yeah, there's some shred sign though, Dr. Atnafu. When you see it goes down there on the left side of the screen when when the mm -hmm. when the clip moves. So there is some degree of shred sign that we don't see all the time. And this was done with a phased array probe, I suppose, which is why we're we're seeing this clip a bit differently. Mm -hmm. But um, it would be interesting to see how that follows up. It's it's interesting how the CRP levels were not um, 
at all uh, raised. You mean the, you know, this area? Yeah, 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 yeah. You are right. This mm. and also going down. If you go downwards on the clip, uh, a little yeah. further down to, on the yeah on the other side. You mean uh, this side? Yeah, up further up, further up, further up. Oh. Yeah, Good. over here, if you turn the clip, you'll see go deep down as a kind of a shred sign. But it depends mm -hmm. on how the baby is breathing. We can see it on and off. Mm -hmm. Let me play it again. Yeah, you yeah. can see here. Yeah, it goes down. Mm -hmm. It goes down every time. Mm -hmm. But further, deeper, yeah. down, not necessarily on the mm -hmm. deeper down in the clip. So probably, yes. Here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Bilateral pearl effusion with uh, multiple consolidations uh, mm -hmm. um, would be interesting to see how that goes but it's very strange i agree that crp levels are not elevated so maybe it's mm -hmm. and the baby is doing well now after the effusion has been tapped and the lungs have been uh, re-expanded i will do or oh, oh, the, the, just maybe after a few days, repeat ultrasound, I will see. But clinically, baby has significant improvement after tapping, and actually, antibiotics was also revised to more potent antibiotics. Is on meropenem right now. Uh, it's true that we don't have much um, information on neonatal pneumonia. There are a couple of, I mean, you know, I know we've been through that, but it's not like in older children where we have so many papers. So it's interesting to learn more about this if the diagnosis is confirmed. Mm. Well, I will you. try to come up with repeat X-ray and with repeat lung ultrasound next time. Yeah, please share with us. Very interesting. Okay. Kirti, I don't know if there's anybody else who will be presenting. No, I think uh, Dr. Alup mentioned that now we can Hi. go into your talk. Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Diet. I'm a pediatric cardiologist in Mexico. And, uh, well, going to present the, the case. Um, Is my screen visible? Yes, it's visible. Thank you. Let me go to the. Okay. So, this is a preterm baby. It's a female of 35 weeks. Uh, his weight is um, 1,844 centimeters. The delivery was from C-section, uh, emergency C-section for starting with, with preterm labor, maybe because an urinary infection. Uh, at the neonatal reanimation, uh, we evaluate an APGAR of six points and the baby received uh, one cycle of uh, positive pressure ventilation. Uh, she was admitted to NICU, and also she's currently in mechanical ventilation. Um, she developed septic shock, and we started the butamine and norepinephrine. So she's doing uh, well, she's stable, but um, she, uh, she's on, on anti antibiotics. Uh, this scan was performed at six uh, hours of flight. So um, this is uh, R1 and R2 uh, in this. Um, I don't know why it's so paused in the shared screen, but uh, we can see a good plural sliding. The Pleura is thickened and the, it's a generalized B profile in both, uh, in both clips. In the R2 clip, we can see uh, an irregular pleura. And uh, well, I think uh, this is my interpretation of these two clips. Moving on. 
this is our tree. Uh, I can tell also it's a, a B profile, good plural sliding, and well, nothing else to, to add. When I move to the uh, left side, I can see also uh, an irregular pleural. Sorry about that. I am think my connection is unstable, but um, let me let me see what can I do. Oh, don't worry. Please go on. Okay. So uh, in L one, uh, there is also the the hard shadow, and in L two, uh, I can see some uh, pleural consolidation, uh, micro pleural consolidation. And also a, a predominantly B profile. For L3, I can uh, I can see some uh, liquid bronchograms. I, I think there are uh, static bronchograms, and also some regions of consolidation. This is the uh, the X-ray of this baby. So uh, all white lung, in the right lung, and uh, well, the, the the tube well placed. Uh, this is all. Uh, the baby was six hours of life. No, sorry, was uh, yeah, between six and eight hours of life when I stand. Yeah, and um, so how did you how did you interpret this? I agree with what you're saying. I'm sorry that you have problems with your connection. Um, we can. I can at least see everything you're describing. I was just wondering, uh, the pictures are blown up really big. So uh, I would think that you wouldn't need to go that deep, but maybe it's just the connection in any case. Um, so what was your interpretation really? And well, uh, my, you want to see the x-ray please. My interpretation was uh, this is uh, for pneumonia because the consolidations, uh, but also I, I am thinking about a uh, surfactant deficiency. Mm. So maybe uh, both uh, components. This you is mean the RDS? Yeah, RDS. And uh, were there any inflammatory parameters or anything? I, I, I missed the part about the infection, I think. Was there uh, any, uh, there was a urinary yeah. infection, the mother's urinary infection, but... Uh, the, the mother was a urinary infection. Also, uh, uh, Jane tells us that uh, she was uh, with chorioamnionitis. Mm. Uh, and uh, the baby has positive inflammatory markers like CPR mm. above uh, 100 mm. and uh, leucos leukocytes in uh, 22,000. Yeah, it makes sense, really. Uh, it makes sense to have these kinds of pictures when you have, um, I guess, uh, infectious alveolitis, and nobody has really described that. We've described, you know, the more classic pictures with larger consolidations. And is it RDS because of the preterm thing? Is it a coupling with the infection that makes you have a secondary surfactant inactivation? So probably a mix of both. I, I would agree with you. And this is what the clinical picture says. I don't know how, how the baby responded to treatment, but the ultrasound pictures make sense. Well, the, the evolution is good. We can uh, take off the uh, norepinephrine and mm -hmm. he's, uh, she is doing uh, now only on the butamine. We expect that uh, we can take off the butamine today. Okay, that's
No, I think if you only had, but then I don't know, if you only had the infection and not RDS, I wouldn't think that you have this extreme B profile everywhere. And I think when you have that, it's also difficult to evaluate complicated RDS. So like you did, you have to take the context into, into account and check for things that are unusual. So this is an interesting case for me because we don't see that that much. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. So Katie, what's next on the program? I think it's your talk, Nadia, if that's all right. Okay. Thank that's you. Fine with me. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you all for presenting. The cases are really interesting and I'm amazed at how you have progressed. Seriously, well done. So since uh, today I've uh, been introduced to several uh, cardiologists, <laughs> it makes sense to talk about heart and lung interactions. Um, and this is uh, a subject that's quite challenging. I'm trying to see how I'm going to manage to get this to beam. I see that I have a couple of issues with my talk. I'm sorry about that, uh, but we'll get there. So it's not really what I call the talk. The title slide is no longer visible, but as always, I don't have any conflict of, um, of interest. I don't know if you can see my screen or not. No, we can't. No, you can't. So actually, it doesn't matter if my slides are working or not, right? Because you can't see them. So uh, let's try and move on. Let me try again. And now? No, not yet. Nothing. That's bad. Okay. Yes, we see them. Now. You see something, right? Yes, thank you. Is it in uh, presenter mode or not? Now it is. Thank Good. you. Okay. Um, so where are we today? Well, we've come a little step further. Uh, we have, when it comes to neonatology, uh, the ethnic point of care POCUS guidelines with cardiac POCUS, with uh, lung focus, and then we've got abdomen, brain, and lines. In addition, we have different guidelines when it comes to TNE, MPE, whatever we called uh, echo performed by the neonatologist. But I'm sticking to focus. Points of care ultrasound is what we do every day. And this is something that adults do extensively. And these new recommendations came out uh, less than two years ago with uh, a very important take home message for me is that that we're evolving. Uh, point of care ultrasound is something that is an evolving skill in critically ill patients. And we as clinicians, uh, we need to evolve too. And we need to be looking more at a global thing and combining organs. Uh, I'm sorry, this doesn't seem to be doing what I want to. Um, here we go, it's blocking my screen. Um, and the panel, when it comes to the thorax, where we have both the heart and the lung, uh, the panel of experts agreed on the use of ultrasound findings combined with clinical assessments to improve our accuracy for uh, the differential diagnosis of respiratory diseases. And we're talking here, uh, different uh, acute respiratory failure, but also for pulmonary embolism in combination with other ultrasound techniques such as critical care echography, the cardiography, which we would translate to combined heart and lung focus. Um, and this goes towards what we're really hoping for in the end, right? We want to have a more holistic approach. We want to be uh, approaching a point of care like we're approaching our clinical reasoning. We're not in the neonate just thinking about is it what's happening with the lung. We're trying to understand what's going on with the baby. And this is, I think, a natural evolution of where we should be going, that we have the possibility to 
um, examining different organs, be it in the context of trauma for those who are working with this or in our eye case and neonatology, where we know that we need to have an insight into the interaction between the different organs. And most importantly, I would say start with in our NICU uh, or in our critical care context for health, those of us are doing that uh, with uh, lung and the heart together, in addition, of course, to lines and abdomen and brain and so forth. But the thing is, one of the main reasons for that, in my opinion, is because we're constantly changing the balance, right? We are ventilating our patients or the patients who are spontaneously breathing, we're giving some kind of, I don't know, treatment management techniques, or maybe it's a question of physiology because we're dealing with, with physio physiologically immature, or let's say differently, um, different physiological mechanisms according to the age. And we need to understand how these interact. So it's especially important for us as neonatologists to have an insight into what's going on with both heart and lung. As you throughout this course have learned to do, we're using it to diagnose respiratory diseases, but also to monitoring lung aeration. And maybe some of you are already using it for practical purposes to give surfactants or to recruit the lung to identify how we should position the babies. But here we're going to talk more about how we can recognize lung edema. So we've talked about how to recognize lung edema when it comes to, for example, RDS or pneumonia, like we've seen today, or other causes. But lung edema can also come from increased pulmonary overload, increased uh, extravascular lung water, which we can see as a complication to uh, hemodynamic changes in the system, uh, heart failure, be it because of structural problems or because of the fact that, for example, like the septic infants, uh, we have uh, myocardial dysfunction secondary to this or related to the prematurity or like we saw one of our patients, the fact that we have uh, open duct or you know, other changes in hemodynamics. What we do know is that the B lines may represent liquid filled interlobular septum alveolo alveoli, but we especially are using is that we're using the B lines as surrogate markers for pulmonary edema or for increased extravascular lung water because we know they correlate extremely well with that. And Daniel Lichtenstein has showed us, and we've learned that we can use lung ultrasound to distinguish between uh, lung edema of cardiac origin versus non-cardiac origin. And basically, we're going back to the basics. Basically, we're going back to the basics. We're, we're looking at the B lines. We're looking at the number of B lines. We're looking at the, 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 the progression of the B lines. And also at the plural line, if you show that are there micro consolidations or not, which give us the full B profile. And with increasing fluid components, with increasing interstitial components, we will have a progressively increased number of B lines. They relate to the quantity of extravascular lung water. And actually, just by simple pattern recognition, A profile versus B profile, we're very good at getting a good idea about the extravascular lung water. And this has been shown here by Volpicelli using comparison with more invasive methods like invasive um, transpulmonary thermodilation, I think it's called. And when you correlate the extravascular lung water in milliliters per kilo with pattern recognition on lung ultrasounds, I think it's really clear to say that we can actually eyeball this quite well as compared to more invasive methods. And it's quicker, it's easier, and it does give us an idea of the underlying uh, so uh, interaction between heart and lung in this case. And there have been many reviews since then. This is one that came out a few, well, almost 10 years ago now. And uh, the use of lung ultrasounds actually in detecting actual extravascular lung water here should be embedded into clinical practice, we should interpret it into our clinical practice algorithm following different uh, guidelines. And it's being used more and more, I don't know, as we see here, our cardiologist colleagues who are starting to use lung ultrasound on a daily basis, should it maybe possibly be a new standard for pulmonary congestion. It's interesting because we can evaluate cardiac function on echo and we can see how good it is 
but let's say the tolerance uh, of this good or bad, necessarily bad uh, cardiac function um, is quite individual, isn't it? Uh, being able to use lung ultrasound to assess for signs of, of lung edema in addition to assessing cardiac function seems to be very valuable. And uh, it has been used and is more and more being used, I think, in a cardiac surgery. First of all, uh, to follow up children before uh, cardiac surgery for congenital heart diseases, uh, especially in babies with a uh, type of cardiac um, congenital heart disease with, with shunts, with the risk for pulmonary overflow, but also postoperatively, uh, which I'm not showing here, uh, it is possible, technically, even on open heart surgery to perform lung ultrasounds and have an idea, for example, in children who have gone, undergone um, extra uh, corporal circulation uh, with risk, of course, of pulmonary edema, to evaluate this and be able to manage the patients also using this. And when compared with chest x-rays, um, they get, it, it performs really well. There's actually less intraoperator variability which is what, not what we would expect, but it goes to show that it is very useful in being able to see the functional significance of uh, heart failure on the lungs. We can use it to assess for complications and for weaning. This is a study that was um, published by a Spanish team, one of the first. Uh, it's, it's asked the question of the usefulness of lung ultrasound in uh, following up neonates with diagnosed congenital heart disease before surgery. And this was a pool of infants with different kinds of uh, heart disease. And the authors found that there was no difference really in the B lines in the first days of life, which is normal, right? We transition from fluid-filled environment, we have fluid-filled lungs, and we're in the NICU or not. But in any case, uh, we, we need some time to completely um, aerate our lungs. However, those who had a um, type of congenital heart disease with shunts, uh, who would be prone to have pulmonary overflow, they started to develop higher uh, B-line scores starting three days of life. Makes sense, right? And there was a good correlation between the echo findings, uh, but uh, there was a better sensibility, uh, sensitivity, sorry, than uh, both the clinical examination and chest x-rays. And just to show the different patterns we can see depending on the different kinds of heart disease, and this, the, the two and the three are um, pictures of the same baby with a few hour, with few days of life uh, going on to more interstitial syndrome. So the conclusion is, yes, it could be useful uh, to follow up uh, babies with congenital heart disease. We know that they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily symptomatic in the beginning because the pulmonary pressures are high. Uh, and then we know that over time, this will increase and they become symptomatic after, let's say, a lapse of time. And lung ultrasound could be very useful there to be able to identify uh, when we have signs of increasing lung edema and possibly start managing maybe direct treatment, maybe it's planning the surgery, what do I know? Or in children that who have problems gaining weight uh, and then are awaiting, we had one, one such patient here uh, presented in the beginning, uh, trying to see how we can titrate this because when we have signs of pulmonary overflow and poor uh, thriving and then we're kind of in a vicious circle or Maybe we're moving on, like in, in, the, in trying to evaluate, assess, for example, persistent duct. Uh, difficult to say, I mean, the question here is not should I treat or not? Because, I mean, we have 27,000 opinions on that. But the question is, um, is there, uh, are, do we have, you know, pulmonary complications related to this overflow? We can follow that up and see the progression towards, you know, B line profile, B lines or B profile, or on the other hand, um, I mean, uh, see whether we should take this into account when we decide how we manage the patients. When it comes to the blue protocol, this is a classical case of uh, heart and lung interaction where we're checking this. We're starting off by assessing for different uh, causes of uh, respiratory distress or dyspnea, 
with hypoxia. But as you can see, uh, this protocol tells us if we have a normal looking lung with lung sliding, we should at once think about something else. So here, pulmonary embolism, well, we check for free veins. Moving down, I know, I know we've gone through this, but uh, lung sliding is present. We've got an A profile, so that means lung sliding with A lines. And that means that this dyspnea or hypoxia is not related to the lung. It doesn't make sense to think there is a lung disease here. So we have to think, go on to plan B, which is checking the free veins. Usually we start with the femoral veins or even the smaller veins. And uh, if, if we have signs of thrombosis, this is where we would move on for pulmonary embolism. And if not, we would look for pneumonia. And uh, using, taking it a step further and using this for non-cardiac hemodynamic monitoring, where you would start off in a shock patient by, of course, doing a very quick eyeballing with cardiac focus to check that the heart is actually, you know, beating. There is some, there is, sufficient uh, cardiac function, uh, and then ruling out um, obstructive shock like we would have in, uh, um, you know, severe um, pulmonary hypertension that could be secondary to pulmonary embolism and, of course, tamponade. In our case, I mean, we do, of course, have um, pulmonary embolism, but it's, in my opinion, very much underdiagnosed. So we don't really know the incidence. But what we do have is pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, especially in uh, the transitional phase. And then later on as complications either to um, sepsis or to pulmonary overflow, like in a large duct, like we saw in case number one. But in the false protocol, once we've ruled out the obstructive shock, we will rule out cardiogenic shock by looking at the lung. And this is where if we find the B profile, we would definitely have to rule out cardiogenic shock by doing an echo. Whilst if we don't have the B profile, we have a more normal looking A profile, then we would probably think about uh, hypovolemic shock that we would try and correct by giving fluid doses or a septic shock. And the sesame protocol is in case of cardiac arrest. And again, you're going through the different causes of cardiac arrest by using the lung. And it's being used. So lung ultrasound is also being used. And I'm taking this, using this different beeline profile and the artifacts we can find to guide lung recruitment, like uh, in this protocol that was uh, published uh, a few years ago in uh, respiratory failure. And you can see that depending on the A lines, the B lines, the consolidations, sliding, no sliding, whether the B lines are focal or diffuse, it will bring us down into the different diagnosis. And one of those is pulmonary embolism. So we're going through the blue protocol or cardiogenic edema, where we have a thin, regular pleura, normal sliding, and then we have, we can even have some effusion. But of course, Oxygenation and hypoxia are not only related to the lung, although we're doing lung ultrasound, it's a lot related to many other things. And we're in a position where we're working with not only physiology that's a bit complex to understand, but also we may ventilate these patients. And like in patient number one, many of these patients are under mechanical ventilation. And this becomes complex, even more complex. Um, and uh, not really understood. When we change our ventilation strategies, we change right ventricular preload and afterload. Uh, when the, the loading conditions are changed, then we we'll, might change the effect on the left ventricular function. And then of course, like in, in our septic patients, what about myocardial dysfunction? Um, so we're in a situation where we have multiple interacting um, things uh, that each have the consequence uh, on the whole system. And again, how a patient with different pathology would react to changes in ventilation when it comes to the lung is different. Like if you, are, you, you have ARDS, 
or if you have pneumonia or if you have something else when you increase peep levels or increase your mean airway pressure that will not affect your lung in the same way and then again it will not have the same effect on your heart and of course also depending on your physiology what extent would you be able to tolerate different things it's confusing and then again when we talk about intrathoracic pressure or what pressures are we talking about is it intrathoracic is it esophagus? is the esophagus is it the pleura is it the cardiac fossa the cardiac surface what does this really mean and um uh, I mean, changes in airway pressure, we're equating that with changes in both the intrathoracic pressure and lung volumes. It's complex. Uh, and there are many practical questions and that we will be asked for each individual patient because although we're starting to learn a bit more in the literature, we know that it's different for each individual depending on the lung volume, the underlying respiratory condition, how we're ventilating, and of course, the cardiac maturity or immaturity and the newborn myocardial cells are notoriously immature. And their response to especially afterload is a bit tricky. So practical questions that we might ask ourselves are to what extent will progressive pressure ventilation and PEEP change the total lung volume and then this intrathoracic pressure. And then how would that again ultimately affect our left ventricular preload, contractility afterload, and how could we actually be able to monitor all this? We have a patient with hypoxia, and we could start off uh, either, let's say, that we are uh, in a position where we have decompensating patients or patients we're treating, and this is where point of care ultrasound seems to be very interesting because it gives us a number of um, insights that we would not get otherwise by chest x-rays or clinically. For example, if we're doing cardiac focus, it might help us in our choice of management should we then for a hypoxic or hypotensive patient give fluid therapy, should we give inotropes going back to our Mexican baby, right? Which inotropes? Should we be doing lung recruitment? What kind of therapy should be in respiratory? And of course, there's always our decompensating infant. We saw the case from Ethiopia where there was uh, effusion, which clearly contributed to this infant's degree of respiratory um, instability. Uh, and we've got tamponade and, and pneumothorax. I, I'm really sorry about this. This is not working out the way I did. I think we have to skip a few slides here. Can you still see this? Yeah, we can yeah, see. I don't know what happened. I think it's it messed up a bit. I'm sorry. Um, so in any case, we have this interaction between the heart and the lung, between the intrathoracic pressures, airway pressures that we're applying. Uh, we have the babies that are being born, maybe, who are in sepsis, who might have different conditions of preload. Have we clamped the cord early on? Have we done physiological cord clamping? Are we in a situation where we have normal cardiac contractility of this heart very immature, or is this sepsis with cardiac dysfunction, or maybe hypoxia with, with uh, really a baby born in asphyxia? And then what's about afterload? Do we have, I mean, have we filled lots of fluids? Do we have a huge duct? Or maybe we have congenital heart disease with lots of you know overflow. Uh, how are our shunts doing? What about our extravascular lung volume? Uh, I mean, vascular volume and hypoxia. So, of course, at birth, which is a very interesting time, we know that physiology changes completely. And there are so many things that interact at this point. And still in the delivery suite, we're not necessarily using point of care ultrasound or lung ultrasound to evaluate what goes on when things don't go well. I think we should because there's so much that could happen. This is from a paper and I see, I didn't put the reference here, it came out in 2022. I think the last author is um, Patrick McNamara, I think. Um, we know there's so much going on uh, in a preterm infant. We've got how we're technically applying our masks or our ventilatory support, but we've also got 
the pH, we've got the way the baby is not responding physiologically to what we're doing. We've got so many things going on and we're not able to see any of this. The only thing we can see is if we have chest rise, if we have a good uh, heart rate or if we have SAT levels and if the baby is rigorous or not. So under normal conditions, spontaneous ventilation is something that requires energy. It requires oxygen, it requires blood flow, and it affects cardiac output, inspiration, expiration. And then it then again creates more demand for oxygen and blood flow. And some hemodynamic effects of ventilations are due to changes in lung volume and chest volume expansion. So normal respiration, inspiration increases the lung volume above the resting end expiratory volume, right? But what happens is that when we're spontaneously breathing, our inspiration is negative pressure ventilation. It decreases our intrathoracic pressure, whilst our positive pressure ventilation increases it. And the differences between both reflect these different ITP swings. Um, I don't think we need to go into many details. It suffice to say that it is complex, especially if every one of these um, factors are changed or are influenced by other things like diaphragmatic contraction. We've got a tiny preterm infant or possibly post-cardiac um, surgery where the diaphragm is compromised. We've got uh, the filling pressures. We've got uh, the pulmonary resistance. Uh, we've got all this. And um, when we're ventilating today, many of us, or at least what's happening is that we are exposing uh, our babies to a ventilator linked injury and atelectic trauma with our cyclic opening and closing of the lung. And sometimes, especially in consolidated lungs and ARDS, uh, we're recommended to, to increase higher levels of PEF, even an RDS, um, to have some lung recruitment and to establish a functional residual capacity. And mechanical ventilation with PEEP primarily affects the cardiac function by changing the lung volumes then and intrathoracic pressure. Um, so going back to how this can actually be interesting for today's talk, we don't have much pediatric specific literature out there on how we combine heart and lung. I showed you what we can do in congenital heart disease. I showed you one of the studies, which is following babies with congenital heart disease up to see how uh, this pulmonary overflow manifests itself on lung ultrasound and how we can program uh, surgery or uh, management of these babies. I talked about how we can use this to evaluate um, the need uh, or at least the degree of pulmonary edema after open heart surgery uh, in children. And these are studies on bronchiolitis. So we, we, you've, you've seen how we can use lung ultrasound to diagnose bronchiolitis. But this is an interesting study because they, they wanted to uh, assess for cardiopulmonary interactions. So using echo and, and, um, and uh, biological markers. Uh, and it's interesting to see it can be done. And this one that came out last year, I think, was, I think is, is probably one of the first papers coming out on using lung ultrasound to detect cardiopulmonary interactions in acutely ill children in the PICU. And what they did was that they checked the different patterns in three different groups of patients. Uh, one of them were healthy children, so controls, and the other ones uh, were all critically ill, but they had different underlying lung diseases. They actually put bronchiolitis apart. And uh, they did this uh, by using also uh, pro-BMP uh, to check whether there was a correlation or whether there was um, an association with the different lung ultrasound patterns. So they did look at, I mean, the full ultrasound examinations and they showed the differences between the different groups. So children who had systemic um, disease, inflammatory disease or sepsis, children who had um, heart disease with uh, probably cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and then uh, children who have bronchiolitis or lower airway diseases, and they compared them with, with um, normal children. And in the sick children, 
What's very interesting is that there is a difference between the patterns, difference between the way the bee lines look and what you can find. So I would recommend you read this paper because it's the first time anybody has done anything like this, but it shows you that, I mean, again, it makes sense to think that what's being going on in the cardiovascular system is reflected on what we can see in the lungs and vice versa. And just doing the echo, many of the intensivists are doing. I'm when I say echo, I don't mean for echo, I mean cardiac focus, or for those of us who are more trained to TNE and EMP. But not looking at the lung doesn't really tell us how our patients are responding to how we're managing them also, especially since we also manage them mainly in neonatology uh, for respiratory conditions. I know in my unit, we are extremely aggressive when it comes to non-invasive ventilation, uh, but we don't necessarily always look at the heart to see how the heart would react to what we do. And we're also quite liberal when it comes to increasing mean airway pressures when we're ventilating even the tiniest babies. We don't have many ventilated babies, but the ones we have, we really ventilate. And we're starting now to see how that affects, for example, um, filling pressures as we would assess, of course, again, using cardiac focus and using methods that are not necessarily 100% validated in the newborn, but still give a useful information when they're extreme. Like for example, inferior vena cava volume, if the inferior vena cava is huge, probably this is not where you want to give fluid or probably you have really high mean airway pressures and you want to like, like want to go down. Or on the other hand, if you've got very exaggerated variability of respiration on um, your uh, cardiac output, then probably this can be a sign, for example, of, of uh, uh, volume, uh, could, give, could give fluid boluses. But above all, I think that by changing the ventilation strategies, especially in the sickest patients or the tiniest patients, when we actually go increasing the pressures, we're positioning patients, we need to see what that does with the heart. And on the contrary, all our patients with heart disease or maybe even high uh, risk of pulmonary overflow, that we check both of them, that we go back and, and check both heart and lung, like for example, large patent ductuses or in sepsis, which is really typically a situation where we have multi-organ failure that we might not detect clinically or by our available monitoring techniques, because how can we actually evaluate hemodynamics on the ward or in the NICU? We've got the pulses, we've got the blood pressure, we've got the SATs, see how the babies are peeing, we've got serum lactates. Some of us have um, non-invasive uh, monitoring methods, electrocardiography, I think it's called. They're easy to do, but they're not possibly giving us the whole thing. And we need to combine that uh, with also other measurements of tissue perfusions, for example, NIRS if we do, but just getting in a view with the echo is something that can really help us get an idea. Even if we're not specialists, it can tell us whether the heart is, you know, by eyeballing it, whether it's a problem of contractility, then maybe we would want to give inotropes. Or on the other hand, it's a question of severe underfilling, or whether by our management, uh, we're actually um instead of improving the i mean conditions for the heart we're actually uh, doing it worse so we saw this and we can use it um to uh serially assess response to treatment like for example the force protocol um, and we are in a situation where we often have hy hypoxic babies in the beginning and we have, I think many of us, the tendency to ventilate the baby, we'll give surfactant, we'll do stuff like this if the baby is preterm, but you've seen the patterns on lung ultrasound. If you have a normal or almost normal or not very sick lung with a very hypoxic baby, of course, our European recommendations say we have to give surfactant if the FI2 levels are above 30%, et cetera, in the tiniest babies, but it doesn't make sense to stop there. A baby with, with a not very sick lung who is very hypoxic probably has some hemodynamic issues, especially during the transitional period or if there is sepsis, right? We have to go further. This baby very possibly has more 
a problem of increased pulmonary vascular resistance with uh, persistent uh, pulmonary hypertension, and then the management would be completely different here. Be it primary, uh, I mean primary, no, I mean secondary to uh, difficulties in transitioning or uh, sepsis or overflow. So this, this changes the management. By just looking up one organ, we're, we're losing this. We've talked about the SAFE protocol and how we're moving on to different organs. And I showed you the video. Uh, and this came out uh, a few weeks ago, which is uh, a working, it's an expert consensus statement. Again, using uh, multiple organ focus, but it's round. So depending on what your primary symptom is, you will assess for heart and lung. But I feel that where uh, we need to be going is also integrating, yes, this combined view. Uh, it doesn't mean that we all need to become echocardiographers because we will not be that and we don't have the capacity to or the know-how. But it does mean that we have to think about also taking a step further and training in cardiac focus, which is simple, which is clearly defined, which is used to really assess for major changes. So cardiac dysfunction, uh, severe uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, of course, tamponades, uh, and uh, be able to, and so forth, and be able to use that to actually combine our management techniques, not only ventilatory techniques or respiratory, but we combining both of them because we know that the one affects the other. And um, I feel that integrated focus would be very interesting. So where are we today? We have the guidelines as a first step. And we're all here learning about lung ultrasound and talking about how we can take it a step further. We've got our cardiologists with us here who are doing exactly what we're talking about. They are so good at assessing the heart. They're now using the lung to get an idea of you know, the combined heart-lung interaction, at least visually. And this is a huge step forward. I think we need to learn from them. Um, I think that using points of care for the neonatologist to assess heart and lung and also all the organs, but your heart and lung can help us uh, individualize our uh, treatment and management for the patients that can also help us possibly limit um, the secondary effects of what we're doing. Like for example, in my unit where we're ventilating very aggressively because we see the lung, so we're going for the lung, but sometimes we forget about the impact on the heart and we should be thinking more about that. Uh, and uh, I think that we need to start incorporating uh, focus, lung heart focus in our resource protocols and when we're managing the critically ill children. So technically speaking, we're in the delivery suite, we're following the resuscitation protocols that we use in our units and the baby's not responding or is not responding as well as the baby should. At some point, we have to ask a question why, and we have to see, it's not only a question whether the mask is fitting or the baby is really premature or not. There are so many factors coming in and having insight by putting the probe might help us get even better. So I'd like to thank the team here and also Yogan Singh with whom has taught me a lot on heart, but also with whom um, we try and work a bit on heart and lung interaction. And I'd like to thank you all. And, of course, Alok and the Improve uh, group who are doing an amazing job and I'm so happy to be part of this. So I finished my talk. Thank you, Nadia. Physiology or not, I hope it's possibly not too much more confusing than it was at the beginning because it is confusing. I hope that we will at some point learn more. Nadia, I have a question. Mm. Now, we're not using nasal high frequency over here. And uh, it's uh, obviously non-invasive ventilation. You, you folks are using it and you were so kind to give us a talk over here. Mm. But my question is, are, are there, do you see different interactions between the heart when you're on non-invasive ventilation, which is kind of uh, air in, air out versus nasal high frequency? And I mean, how important is it? Is it important... To, is your question a lot regarding nasal versus, I mean, invasive high frequency? Or is no, your question no, high frequency versus uh, plus the pressure ventilation? It's nasal uh, high frequency, non-invasive versus non-invasive ventilation. So well, one more time, sorry, I, I missed that. 
sorry when we use you're using non-invasive high frequency which is kind of nasal high frequency in Paris yeah we we're not using it that much but but we have some experience yes and uh, I mean is heart lung in kind of interaction looking at the filling looking at is, is that part of the assessment when you're kind of trying to wean babies it should be shouldn't it uh, it is a little bit uh, it is uh, we usually check both but we don't necessarily um, do heart, I mean, cardiac focus every time we change ventilation strategies. We do that in the beginning when we start or when we're uh, doing a reassessment. Um, I'm not, I mean, in the babies who have been on high frequency ventilation, in our case, that has usually been mostly evolving BPD babies who either usually uh, we're in the process of failing non-invasive ventilation and we're all, I mean, we're starting to become acidotic, uh, hypercapnic or with many spells. Uh, and it was more like a rescue treatment. And actually many of these babies were not pre-intubated. It works really, really well on CO2 levels. So babies stabilize on this, you keep them on for one, two, three days. And at that point, we really had a more, a no, you know, no touch, uh, little you know, minimal touch policy. But what we could see is that once the, looking at other parameters and before starting, of course, we would do a scan to check that the baby, I mean, how the baby was doing and so on before putting this into action. But uh, in the beginning, once you get used to it, maybe the baby's a bit tachycardic and so forth. And once the baby settles down, actually the tolerance is good. So we would not necessarily to repeat necessarily scan. do it yeah. my other question was what about pd assessment and kind of looking at lung profiles uh, in particular you know the interstitial edema are you, is that are you looking for diuretic related assessment or is that do you think that still needs more work in in the and it's more work almadina has published on bpd and diuretics but of course it's it's complicated it's bpd is multifactorial hmm. Uh, however, if the question is on PDA, it was PDA or BPD? PDA, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it should somehow be a very good tool, but I also feel that we're not looking at this. I mean, for the babies who did not have severe RDS or did not need surfactants, the lungs are relatively cleared. So when they worsen, you know that this is probably something else. They might have evolving BPD, but it's not the same pattern. The pattern in P PDA overflow is the pattern of lung edema with increased extravascular lung water. However, where I'm a bit more unsure is the babies who have had this already have white lungs mm -hmm. and are very immature. And of course, it would depend when. If you're doing your PDA scan at 10 days of life. Yep. Yeah. If you're doing a PDA like we're doing, we're doing it at 72 hours. We're doing heart, lung, brain, you know, the whole thing. Yep. Uh, at that point, it's difficult yep. to know. If you know that your baby previously had, has clearer lungs and you have a large PDA and the lungs are white, okay. Uh, but if you have a baby, like we've seen babies who did not get the diagnosis of severe RDS in the beginning, and then you rescan them, they're all white, and you go, oh, did I miss the diagnosis? And you have the answer. You have a large shunt. Yeah, yeah. So that's really, I, yeah. that's really helpful for us because I completely agree. The question is, in the early days, is this bad RDS? You know, how do you differentiate between what the etiology is at that particular point? I think it's something that we were kind of thinking more in terms of the non-invasive babies who have ducts with large shunts, and whether diuretic management can guide treatment and. Uh, it's one of those things where people kind of say to us, diuretics don't work. And we have a school of thought, 11 of us over here, five of us probably think diuretics don't work at all and there's no point. And yeah, you know, no, we, we're in no diuretics land here in the early in the early course. But I mean, who knows? I think what, what I think where we should go to be mm -hmm. able to answer this question is to look closer at the patterns. I think we're missing things. I think for now, when we're looking at different patterns in the newborn, we're looking at global patterns. I don't think we're looking where we should be looking. I think we should be looking at the plural line. And I think we'll find specificities, especially since we're scanning most of us with high frequency linear probes. I think, I don't know, but I think the question would be even more interesting if we had like super mega high frequency probes. 
or if not, maybe somebody who's very good at pattern recognition or artificial intelligence, I don't know. I think there will be a difference in patterns related to uh, severe RDS and evolving BPD versus pulmonary overflow, I think, but I'm not able to see it with my eyes. And, you know. That's really helpful. Doris, you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Nadia. And uh, we talked about the slides where you talked about um, when really you were going through the protocol and talked about pulmonary embolism. Yeah. It's something we can pick up in neonates. How do we? Yeah, we have the neonates. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But has any of you ever read the paper on neonatal pulmonary embolism? No. Uh, has anybody made the diagnosis? No. I have once just once, and it took me a very long oh. time, although we've gone around this baby for like many hours saying, this PP, this hypertension doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Should we be thinking of pulmonary embolism? Yeah, I know, you know, because premature and babies come in. And we saw the palm, we saw the clots actually in the end. But I once I saw this, I said, well, how many others did I miss? Probably tons. We don't know anything about this because we don't look for it. We don't know how to look for it. So I think it's, I think it's, I mean, now that we're seeing in my units, many cases of intracardiac um, thrombosis because we're looking for it. Also, I think we're putting large catheters into small veins, which we probably shouldn't be doing. And we have babies with a very immature clotting system. Um, and we're not the only ones seeing this. So we might not be very good, but we're not probably alone, which is not very reassuring for the babies, I think. But in any case, if we're seeing so many intracardiac um, thrombosis that we're treating now, how many do we not see? And how many did we not see if we're not doing systematic echo? I mean, cardiac focus. And what about all these babies with PPHN or the babies who go on to have spells or the babies who severely decompensate? We don't know how to look for pulmonary embolism. So Doris, I have no idea what to tell you. I can just imagine it's like everything else. If we don't know, if we don't look for it, we don't find it. And we, if we don't know how to look for it, mm. we don't have to find it. It probably wouldn't be the same pattern like in adults where they have, you know, deep venous thrombosis as I click, it goes over. This probably is a bit different, but it ends up in the same place. And our problem is that these babies have shunts everywhere. So it can start anywhere and it ends up where it shouldn't, right? depending on your pulmonary pressure. So I would be very interested to learn more. Wow. Okay, thank you. Fascinating. Zaradine? Uh, oh, sorry. No, I, go I for it. No, that's all right. Zaradine, you have a question? Uh, just a quick, actually, um, uh, comment, because Doris has exactly asked the same question that I was, because uh, I was, um, throughout the talk, I was thinking about the pulmonary embolism. You touched on it. I thought you were initially you are talking about adults, but then you uh, specified neonates. Yes, I have never uh, diagnosed it, um, and uh, partly we've been put off thinking that way because of the old school of thought of avoiding anticoagulation therapy in neonates because of the risk overriding the benefit from any treatment. So, to be honest, we've we've blanked that area of thinking. Um, about embolism in neonates uh, because we know that we will end up having the same answer from our hematologist saying <laughs> don't do no, it don't go there don't do it. just watch it it will get better um, I've seen it I've seen really huge huge um, clots uh, along the big vessels blocking the whole but uh, we just sat and uh, did nothing mm -hmm. and that is probably uh, as I said uh, blocked the thought about this possibility in, in neonates. It's an interesting explanation because when you see the clot, I mean, for me at least, uh, my adrenals go crazy. I'm a bit stressed. Whether I treat, or whether I don't treat, it's extremely stressful. So, uh, but I agree with you. I don't think it's just related to pulmonary embolism or clot steroidine. I don't know if you agree with me. I think it's, a, it's just our way of thought. We have, we live like, I don't know, our babies are different. Physiology is different. It's not the same thing. And in any case, we're not going to do anything about it. So we won't look, but things have changed, right? I mean, we're starting to treat things we never treated before. We're starting to look at the lung that we never looked at before. We didn't even know we could look at the neonatal lung. We're starting to diet, 
do hemodialysis in tiny preterm babies? Who knew we could? We're starting to, you know, think that maybe we could find a solution for BBT. Who knows, maybe in the coming years, there will be some change, some advances in surfactant neonatology. And it all goes through, you know, people who think and change so like you're doing, Zaradine, just changing the question, changing the paradigm, saying, but I mean, maybe, maybe we just have to look elsewhere. Why wouldn't a baby not have pulmonary embolism? I mean, it is the period of life, except for pregnancy and when you're having surgery and stuff like this, where you have a clotting system that is actively pro-clot and completely unbalanced. Uh, Why wouldn't you have clots? We're putting lines in everywhere. We've seen the clots. Why wouldn't they have an embolism? Well, thank you so much. That's an excellent way of um, thinking. And, I, and I'm hoping that obviously this will open up the, the way for lots of other things. And the, uh, that's, that's the way forward. And I agree 100%. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with I, don't, I I think we're missing the big picture here still. We're trying, we're trying, but I think we're just scraping the surface. I think like you ask a lot about PDN. I, I don't think we're, we still haven't found out how we're looking. We're not looking right because we're not used to doing it. It's new for us. It's like when engineers ask us what we need. I, I work a little bit with engineers and it's been very valuable because I've understood that I have no imagination whatsoever. And they say, Oh, you neonatologists, you're just, you're so bothersome. We're, we can do anything you want and you don't ask us for anything. And I said, oh, but we're asking for lots of stuff. But what we're asking for is, can this machine auto-regulate oxygen so we don't need to go and change this? Can we do this little bit? Because we're just, my I am confined to what I know. And then I see the engineers who come to me and say, listen, Nadia, we, we have so much technology, we don't know what problems you have, so we have to invent problems because, you know, we don't know if this really happens. And then he talks about something and we found this super mega solution to do this. I'm like, you can do that stuff? He's like, oh yeah, this is easy. Uh, and the problem actually exists. I never even thought that we could, you know, think of a solution to it. And now I've understood that the only limitation we have is our imagination. These engineers can do anything, which also means that there is no limitation to what the human body can do. We just have to, you know, like you said, break the barriers and think not even out of the box, just start rethinking everything. Everything is possible. It's just that I personally still don't know how to go about it. So I'm, I'm amazed at what the engineers can do. So I think I should be, and I'm amazed about what preterm babies can do. So I think there's hope. Here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I'm really grateful. I'm going to take this opportunity to thank Nadia and thank Kirti for kind of covering while I was tied up with some calls. God bless you all. Uh, I'm very, very grateful. And I hope you all have a good evening. God, take care. Thank you. 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 Thank you.